Namaskar, hello and welcome. You are with Argumentative Engines and I am Bhuvan Apoor Vichha. The story of India's progress from the 1940s, when the first nuclear program of India was initiated by Homi J. Bhabha, to the present times when India has completed the nuclear triad, has been a story of many twists and turns. What has remained constant, though, is India's commitment to developing nuclear weapons as solely a part of its defensive arsenal. A policy of no first use, NFU, of nuclear weapons has characterized India's security doctrine. The country's formal nuclear doctrine from January 2003 includes a no first use pledge, albeit with caveats. Now, what are those caveats? India may consider the nuke option as a retaliation against attacks using chemical and biological weapons. Nuclear weapons would also be used to repress a nuclear attack on Indian territory or any part of Indian forces. The Indian diplomats have often advanced the country's commitment to, using, to not using nuclear weapons first as proof of the country being a responsible state and thereby as a means to resist any pressures to sign any treaties that would affect its nuclear arsenal. It would seem natural then that no first use is a core element of India's nuclear weapons posture. However, statements by late Manohar Parikar, the former defense minister of India, who had said, and I quote, why do a lot of people say that India is for no first use? Why should I bind myself? It would seem then that the no first use, I, would, I should say that I'm a responsible nuclear power and I will not use it irresponsibly, end of quote. Thereafter, most recently, the statement by current defense minister, Sri Rajnath Singh, when in Pokhran, the center field of India's nuclear progress, the defense minister comments, and I quote, India is a nuclear power and yet remains firmly committed to the doctrine of no first use. India has strictly adhered to this doctrine. What happens in the future depends on circumstances, end of quote. Now, these two statements have put the focus back on India's no first use posture. When seen in the light of the nuclear postures of Pakistan, which has no clear doctrine, and China, which though claims to be committed to no first use, has been expanding its nuclear warheads at an alarming pace. So the question we are asking this evening at Argumentative Indians, does India's no first use posture or doctrine as some may say, stand the test of military pragmatism or has the no first use lost its relevance. To discuss the possible answers of the question, should India discard its no first use stance, I'm joined by an eminent set of voices this evening. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Bharat Karnad, Emeritus Professor at CPR and a national security expert, Dr. Rajesh Rajagopalan, Professor of International Politics, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi, Lieutenant General Syed Atta Hasnain, retired Army General and member of the NDMA in the status of Secretary to the Government of India, and Sri Manoj Joshi, journalist and distinguished fellow at the Observer Research Foundation. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining us at Argumentative Indians this evening. Let me begin with Dr. Bharat Karnad. Sir, has the time come for India to discard its no first use stance or posture? Well, I think it's long past the time since we ought to have declared the first use, or at least not pronounced uh, no first use as a doctrinal constraint. Uh, the fact of the matter is um, no first use, minimum deterrence, these concepts of self-constraint were essentially um, something that the drafting committee, for instance, of the draft doctrine in the first NSAB uh, contemplated simply because the prime minister had already announced it on the floor of the parliament. So had we drafted a doctrine that jettisoned the prime ministerial directives on, on minimum deterrence and no first use, uh, it is very likely uh, the draft doctrine would have been trashed right away. So that's the reason why we were in one sense compelled to include and uh, you know, sort of encompass it in the draft doctrine. That said, I think from the very beginning, uh, the, the Indian government was quite clear 
that as Kesh Brahmanyam once, uh, the convener of the first National Security Advisory Board, uh, mentioned to me, and I've used it in my book, uh, Nuclear Weapons and Indian Security, he said, minimum deterrence, no first use. These are nice sounding phrases. They make us look moderate. So this is the point that has always been lost, that this was a thing that is there that we talk about, that Rajanath Singh recently mentioned again, reiterated the first use, no first use uh, aspect, uh, more as a public relations. You know, I mean, no first use will be the first casualty in war. It is credible only in peacetime. But well, once there is war, talk of no first use goes out the window. I mean, uh, because you see, in a very real sense, no first use straddles the divide between ideals and military liability. So military liability is what, uh, you know, it'll become, should we actually, in, in real terms, stick to no first use. Um, think of the absurdity this way, how absurd the notion is, especially for India, which has no civil defense measures, which has, you know, hardly any disaster management uh, worth talking about. You know, we have none of the infrastructure for any of these things. And yet we think uh, in our right mind, uh, really, uh, that we'll be able to absorb a nuclear first strike? When you talk about retaliation only, does it make sense when you don't have any of these things that would make such a stance credible in the first place? And no first use would be credible if you had good civil defense measures that all the, peoples of, uh, the, the people in the country were completely aware of, had practiced all the time. If our disaster management agency, for instance, was able to do you know, deal with the normal floods and typhoons and so on that we get every year. And when we have our cities inundated with monsoon strike <laughs> and we are left immobile, do you think really that we'll be able to absorb a nuclear first strike and then retaliate? This is the real problem. You see, it doesn't make sense. And it was never supposed to make sense other than as uh, everybody talked, knew when we were drafting it, people in the, uh, the government knew about it. And I one only hope that those in the military were not really seduced by this notion of no first use because really it cannot be sustained in crises or war. Now that said, what are the, uh, the uses of the first use? As I recommend that we go first use, not against Pakistan, for God's sake. Pakistan is a minor adversary, as I've always said, there's never been a threat to India is not now, never was, and will never be. Now it's against China. Nuclear weapons are for China. Now why is it you know, sustainable against China, a first use um, you know, commitment? Because it is conventionally far superior to India, far superior. It is why North Korea has successfully thwarted American designs at compelling uh, Pyongyang. Because they have said, look, we are going to bomb Guam. First strike, we'll take out Tokyo. First strike, if we get any hint of incoming missiles from uh, in the US arsenal. And that's what's kept the Americans at bay. Now, this is what we have to keep in mind when we think of the Chinese. And I have said, therefore, that we need to forward deploy uh, at least the Agni ones, the 700 kilometers. Uh, some of them uh, perhaps are nuclear tipped or our Prithvis and so on, and have them forward deployed uh, with the Chinese just so that they're aware of a short fuse deterrent that becomes real should they actually break through or have any serious uh, designs on getting to the Brahmaputra line, for instance, as, as nearly happened in 1962. Now, the thing is that some will say, ah, well, you know, this is not, uh, you know, we are far... Is not 1962, our military is far more capable, etc., etc. But that needs to be tested in the field. And I'm afraid until we have, and look, you may say that we have built up, our infrastructure is far better than in 62 and so on, but still is nowhere able to match what the Chinese have on the Tibetan plateau. And as long as you don't have the kind of infrastructure and the support system that the Chinese have, 
both in in terms of integrated command, cyber war, etc., etc., that can take out your communications, uh, both your and how much of that they can take out is still not certain, given that there are redundancies built into our nuclear command control and so on. But let's assume that they are very powerful and they get through. What happens then? They compound the problem of conventional uh, uh, superiority for us, that is, they compound the problem for us, while also having the cyber age. So what are you going to do? Your new convention, nuclear, uh, convention military may be sidelined without the nuclear weapons coming into, uh, into, uh, the, uh, uh, the, into action at all or into, into uh, the reckoning. So therefore, what I've suggested is that in, in the latest book, 2018, staggering forward, that we forward deploy our uh, nuclear weapons, these short range and medium range nuclear tip missiles, we also declare it publicly as to what will happen. We also declare what the target sets are by way of taking out the three gorges dam on the Yangtze River, by you know, taking out Lopnor with aerial strikes, Sukhois, 30s, whatever it is we can uh, manage, or longer range Agnis, etc. So that there is a cost. Now the question is, are you willing to escalate? The whole problem is India's credibility in terms of having the will to face China. That's always been the problem, isn't it? I mean, even conventional military wise, do we have the will to stand up to China and, <coughs> and in a sense deal with whatever they can put across by way of their military capability, which is huge. So my contention is, and has always been, uh, in some sense, the developments now uh, you know, in a sense, validate the arguments I've been making over the last 25 years that we have to become serious about nuclear weapons and not be concerned so much about our status as a responsible nuclear weapon, whatever that means. I mean, our sense of responsible state behavior is that we do something unlike, at least in the declaratory sense, that most other nuclear weapon states don't do. What is the point in making a doctrine public, for instance? I mean, ridiculous kind of things we do by a, a permanent secretariat of the government and even the military, which really ha has no clue, is not clued into the deterrence literature or deterrence history or development of nuclear weapons. So, short point, I think it is time, unless we get our nose rubbed in the, you know, in the dirt again by the Chinese PLA, we'll have to make it clear to the Chinese that they'll have to have bear the cost of escalating and we have to show our willingness to escalate and to confront them with the first use, yeah. Doctor. Yes, thank you, Dr. Karnad. And let me bring in uh, Dr. Rajagopalan uh, on this because you have written extensively on India's nuclear doctrine and how it should go about. Uh, would you agree with uh, Dr. Karnad's assertion that India should uh, overtly take a more aggressive stance when it comes to China? <clears throat> Uh, no, those are two different uh, sort of questions. I mean, uh, the question about NFU and taking um, a more uh, active stance against China, you know, at the, the, that's a conventional, on the conventional side, not on the nuclear side. So I would, of course, disagree with uh, Bharat uh, entirely uh, in terms of the logic of India's policy, uh, as well as in terms of whether we need uh, to give up uh, the NFU now. Uh, nuclear weapons essentially serve uh, one purpose, which is to ensure uh, national survival. And so countries that have a, a threat of national survival, that face a threat of national survival, either from conventional means or from nuclear means, uh, will have to have uh, a, a, uh, a response to that particular threat. Now, the, and there are many countries that face a conventional threat uh, to national survival, or at least perceive that they face a conventional threat to national survival. Pakistan is one right next to us, uh, which thinks that because of India's far uh, larger conventional forces that, and because of its peculiar geography and so on, that it, uh, it might uh, face a threat of extinction, that it faces a threat of extinction from India's conventional military forces. And that is why they immediately after 1971, after the war, Bangladesh war, uh, that they began their nuclear weapons program. Israel faces a similar threat um, in terms of, or at least perceives that it faces a similar threat. 
uh, india doesn't face that india doesn't face a conventional you know, threat of a national extinction or a national survival what it faces uh, in terms of a national survival is in terms of being attacked by nuclear weapons and that is precisely why we have uh, our nuclear weapons are not meant to, to counter uh, uh, a conventional threat it is meant primarily to counter the nuclear uh, forces of other countries and so the deterrence that we have the deterrence policy that we have is precisely that if we are attacked with nuclear weapons that we will retaliate with nuclear weapons so, so that is all we need because um uh, irrespective of uh, our uh, bharat mentioned earlier that uh, about our poor preparedness for dealing with a first attack the point is that irrespective of whether it's a first attack or a retaliatory attack or whatever mm-hmm. if we are in a nuclear war none of us are prepared i don't mean, know country is prepared and it doesn't matter whether you're china or the united states or india um and so the idea that uh, in it's a nuclear first use um that we and even if we attack you know we, we are, if they uh, but it's argument that uh, we should attack first because we are not prepared for the civil defense part of uh, a nuclear war how would attacking first remove that problem because it is not as if attacking first uh, will prevent uh, any of our adversaries either china either of our adversaries either china or pakistan from retaliating and so we'll face the same problem i mean that problem doesn't go away and that is that therefore that is not a very good argument for attacking force so uh, and and the other part of it as i was saying in terms of conventional weapons i mean conventional forces conventional strength it is true that we have our conventional military balance with china has steadily deteriorated but as of now at least um to the extent that we know china's ambitions are at one level political in terms of hegemony over south asia and over the indo pacific and so on but at another another level in terms of a specific military objective it is at the border it is uh, uh, along the lac the territories that they claim um, uh, across the lac it is not conquest of india if it were conquest of india or if it were if we were a small country um facing uh, a potential uh question of survival in a conventional war i would agree with that but even if we lose all the territory that china claims are not in pradesh uh the uh, small the bits of pieces of territory that they still haven't taken in ladakh india would continue as a state i mean we would be grievously harmed grievously injured as we were in 62 but it doesn't it, it is not a question of national survival, right if it were a question of national survival i would agree entirely and so countries like pakistan or um uh, israel or uh, north korea for all of them because they are small and because they face much larger adversaries they, it's a question of national survival and that's the same thing for nato uh, uh, in the in the in the central central european theater during the cold war their concern was about survival and when your concern is about survival yes i would agree you should use nuclear, you, you could at least try to use nuclear weapons first to ensure that you uh, that the other side is deterred from threatening your survival we do not face a threat to our survival right uh, the only threat that we face to our survival is if china uses it, china or pakistan uses it and that is deterred by threatening to use nuclear weapons in retaliation so there is so the logic of uh, our nfu is uh, is you know it is that uh, the only threat to our national survival comes from others using nuclear weapons and so that is our focus we have never sought to um to deter conventional war or conventional attacks with nuclear weapons because we don't have to we don't have any reason to we are the only country that is a match for us uh, uh, conventionally is china and of course they are getting stronger and stronger but their objectives are limited i mean and so their 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 military uh their military um uh, power does not threaten our india's survival i would fully agree with bharat if you are talking about enhancing our conventional military capabilities or being much more proactive um in conventional in developing our conventional forces in you know in doing what we should do in ladakh or arunachal pradesh have absolutely no problems no questions about that but how would you see nuclear weapons first prevent uh, uh you know uh, help us in any of those contexts that is talked it does not help 
right? I mean, and so I would argue that NFU is still a valid and a credible uh, doctrine for India, um, irrespective of what China's nuclear force. Because even if it is China's nuclear force, as Bharat Kelsal mentioned, if North Korea with a handful of nuclear weapons can deter the United States with thousands of nuclear weapons, we have no problems in deterring China. Because uh, I would agree with this targeting uh, argument. Right? I mean, you can uh, target the, the Three Gorges Dam, or you can target the, I mean, enough enough targets in China that would uh, ensure that they that they do not survive as a functioning society if they ever attack us with, if they ever attack us with nuclear weapons, irrespective of the nuclear balance between them. Uh, that is, so to that extent, um, the fact that we have a relatively small nuclear arsenal, uh, I would agree that there are areas where we need to improve. We need to have more SSVNs. We need to have missiles with longer ranges and so on and so forth. I mean, we have been way too slow in terms of developing our capabilities. But that aside, large numbers do not make any mistakes in as far as returns goes. Let me stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Raja Gopalan. And uh, let me bring in a Lieutenant General Syed Atta Hasnan. Sir, you have had a long and uh, distinguished uh, career in the Indian Armed Forces. Uh, so I have two questions for you. First, uh, obviously, should India look to discard its no first use policy? Which side of the fence are you sitting on? And number two, as uh, Dr. Bharat Karnad said that we lack the civil defense preparation. So in your current role as part of the NDMA, would you agree with the statement that we lack the capability to absorb a nuclear strike and then probably proceed to strike again? Sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Am I, am I audible? Sure. Yes. Right. Thanks very much. A very, very interesting points of view. Two outstanding um, academics, uh, analysts in front of us and two different points of view. Mm, I don't know. I, maybe I would like to toss a coin and see which side I should... Uh, align myself. But I do think I tend to go along with Dr. Rajesh Rajagopalan a little more. But let me just remind you, in the five minutes that I have, and let me just remind you first, when Mr. Parekar spoke about this in 2015, 2016, at least 2016, Mr. Parekar's uh, whole idea to my mind, uh, he spoke in a particular India Today debate at uh, in Taj Man Singh, I still remember, I mentioned this, I spoke about it a lot there. A lot of us questioned him after that. To my mind, it's his intention was entirely to draw a red herring, primarily to message Pakistan. Although Dr. Kannad says that Pakistan is unimportant in this, we can swat it off like a fly. But uh, to my mind, I do think Pakistan has uh, still got some significance as, we are, as far as we are concerned. Mr. Parikar's intention was that there to test the waters and see how does the world feel, how does Pakistan feel, anyone else who's on the receiving end of India's nukes, how do they feel about uh, this sudden talk about the change of India's nuclear doctrine. Uh, there was a little bit of a ripple, it was felt here and there, the ripple was not felt in China at all, the ripple was felt more across uh, the LOC, across in Pakistan and lots and lots of literature, lots of discussions started uh, emanating there. So I at that time, I was just questioning myself. I'm not so much of an expert on nuclear policy or doctrine, uh, looking at it primarily as a practitioner. I said, why is, is the NFU cast in concrete, the cast in stone? I mean, do we have to say that uh, we have declared NFU as a doctrine, as a nuclear doctrine, and tomorrow if there's an existential issue that India faces, against Pakistan or against China, you mean to say we will have to first declare to the world we are changing our doctrine and now we will take, take on a first use possibly. I don't think that's required at all. I mean, the degree of flexibility built into this, into this whole thing. Policy doctrine is meant to be flexible, right? And if it meets your ends, first class, absolutely. That is what it is meant for. And uh, you are going to talk in a situation which is a situation of virtual desperation, which is what first use is all about, about survival. And then nothing stops you from, from uh, changing your policy in midnight, in two seconds, and, and going ahead with what you intend to do. So NFU, in terms of projection to the world, the NFU is there. This is what is our declared status. But I think the... The unwritten part of it underneath very clearly says that should the contingency arise, should the contingency arise, we will be flexible and change our policy. And I'm, I'm at least quite clear on that. There's a, uh, in terms of national security, you don't have to wait for 
directions and orders to change your doctrine and your policy. Uh, I agree with Dr. Kanat to the extent that uh, we need to take many more non-military measures. Why non-military itself? Conventional military measures and lots and lots of non-conventional military measures. Uh, in terms of our infrastructure, um, one of the things which I always talk about is survivability. Forget the survivability of the country, the survivability of the army, of the armed forces themselves in terms of uh, much better uh, protection in a, in a nuclear environment. The kind of protection, conventional protection is nothing. Three feet of earth on top of a soldier's head is just about nothing. So we need much, much more of this. And the kind of missilery which China is displaying at the moment, you are going to find a tremendous amount of conventional munition coming on top of you. And then possibly, if ever it happens, you may even find a nuclear strike coming on you. Uh, but I must uh, outline this fact that uh, to me, Pakistan is significant. Let, let me just uh, I try and introduce a, a bit of a red herring myself out here. If, if Let's just go back to the scenario of 1965, hypothetically, 65. In 1965, if India was a nuclear armed power and Pakistan was not, what options would have arisen when the Pakistan army was threatening to break through at Asaluddha? You remember this famous thing which came into Asaluddha, the midnight call which came to General Harbaksh to say, pull back to the, uh, to the Bias and defend Jalandhar at all costs. That was half of Punjab going at that time. How would India have, if it was, a, if we, we had a nuclear option, how would we have responded to it? Would we say we will have a second strike or a first strike? This is something which, uh, which uh, still does, gels in my mind and I keep wondering as to what would we have done. If both India and Pakistan were both nuclear armed and, and India had declared a no first use and Pakistan had not, then a breach at at Akhnur and a full breach at Asal Uttar to directly threaten uh, Amritsar from the south and Jalandhar from the, from the west, what kind of a situation would it have led to? Would we say that uh, uh, no first use or would we have straight away changed our mind thing to bring in a first use, use possible use at that, at that stage? These are live scenarios of that time when no nuclear weapons existed. Very interesting to have a look at it in case, hypothetically, nuclear weapons had existed at that time. Lastly, uh, on the specific issue which you asked me, Apoor, uh, on the aspect of civil defense. Okay, the, your preparedness for war is never complete. As you are aware, it's never complete. I mean, it's always 70, 80, 90 percent. Uh, at the moment, there's no doubt... Uh, and, uh, and uh, Dr. Bhargkanan was absolutely right in his observation that uh, the kind of floods, the kind of uh, other disasters that we are facing, uh, our capability to, to stand up to these disasters is reasonably questionable. I was, I'm with the National Disaster Management Authority. I can assure you uh, there has been a tremendous improvement of our capability, not to say that at any time we can ward off all disasters. But let me just remind you, in specific cases, 1999, the Odisha cyclone, 2001, the Bhuj earthquake, 2004, the tsunami, each of them on an average 50, 15,000 fatalities. In the last three years, you've had cyclone after cyclone on the eastern coast. On the east coast, our casualties have not topped double digits. That's because we've got a, a, a national cyclone risk mitigation program of $1 billion dollars run by the World Bank in conjunction with the World Bank, which is doing wonders and reducing that kind of a thing. Similarly, many more programs are coming up now. National Earthquake Risk Mitigation Program, National Landslide Risk Mitigation Program. We've had two terrible landslides in the last uh, two weeks itself, one in Manipur, one in JNK. These are not going to end climate change. You're seeing what's happening with climate change. This is not going to end so quickly, but we can mitigate. We can mitigate definitely. As it comes to, when it comes to the urban areas in India, there's a dire requirement for our civil defense to get more professional. Although, let me tell you, volunteerism and uh, community uh, response, which is two very, very important things when it comes to war fighting in these kind of stages of war fighting, both of them are coming of age. These are, we, are at our, we are at the initiation stages, and I do say in the next three, four, five years, much more will come as far as that capability is concerned. 
they, uh, I hope people are aware that the 15th Finance Commission has allotted a fairly high chunk of money for capability development and mitigation, uh, which is being expended today by the National Disaster Management Authority, something which we just didn't have in our hands before. So I agree with Dr. Karnad. We are not at that stage of preparation. Definitely not. No. But much is being done to reinvigorate all this uh, by the government of India. Uh, particularly, I would like to focus on the field of home guard, civil defense, etc. Reinvigorate this whole thing. There's a whole a policy being looked at for bringing ex-servicemen into this fold, for bringing what is what we are calling uh, the friends of uh, friends in disaster, what are called Abda Mitras, 15,000 of them already under training at the moment. So all this is in the melting pot. Abda Mitras will ultimately top 100,000 when, when they are fully trained and they would be catering for uh, situations of this kind, nuclear warfare kind of situations too. So I'll stop here at this stage. My a uh, definitive answer to your first question, Apur, is that I go along with Dr. Rajesh Raja Gopala, Gopalan, that um, I think uh, the doctrine of uh, NFU needs to continue to survive and must maintain, they, we must maintain a degree of flexibility when it comes to its execution, which should be known to the rest of the world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, let me bring in uh, Sri Manoj Joshi. Uh, so you have written uh, extensively at the Observer Research Foundation. In fact, the ORF also has written extensively on India's no first use stance on both sides of the argument. Uh, I'd like to know your views uh, as to whether should India discard its no first use stance or has it lost, has it lost its uh, credibility in terms of erosion since 2003? Uh, is there a shift in India's no first use posture? Well, you know, uh... The Indian nuclear test, there's a background to this whole no first use. So the nuclear tests of 98 were a major shock uh, to the international system at its time. And they required India to adopt a certain posture to soothe the international opinion. I mean, we came under global embargoes and everyone came down on us like a ton of bricks. So we had to soothe the international opinion. So concepts that, like credible minimum deterrence or no first use. These were all mooted for that, that purpose. I mean, in themselves, you can criticize both of them and at some level, they make no sense. Now, they were adapted to deal with India's traditionally pacifist posture, to which we have, we, normally India was seen as a kind of a pacific kind of a country. So in essence, it called for a minimal arsenal to prevent India from suffering a nuclear attack uh, or threat of an attack. It said that India would adopt a minimalist posture, which would provide for assured retaliation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so, a paper that was tabled in Parliament, "Evolution of Indian Nuclear Policy," this was in May of '98, repeated the readiness to discuss the no first use as a bilateral measure. So, initially, we said we'll discuss it bilaterally. With I think Bharat referred to this that uh, the Prime Minister also, uh, Prime Minister Vajpayee, in August, uh, he very clearly laid out the NFU. Uh, uh, of the country. And these were all basically measures to, uh, um, to soothe public opinion. As a reporter, I covered many of these uh, press conferences, etc. At the sidelines of this, I think this <coughs> press conference after Vajpayee's uh, speech, the then National Security Advisor, <coughs> Mr. Rajesh Mishra, he told me quite bluntly, he said, I don't agree with no first use. This is the national security advisor telling me. And when, when on the stage, the, 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 they have just announced uh, backing of no first use. And let me tell you, I've had three, at least three national security advisors tell me that they don't really agree with no first use. I can't name them, but uh, uh, they've told me uh, this. So there are three factors involved. As I said, one is the global opinion. In the aftermath of the test, the second was, you know, to to uh, the the second was to position India's nuclear arsenal in a Pacific category different from that of Pakistan and China. So we had to show that we are different from uh, these um, uh, countries. The third was the practical one, which I think has been mentioned by many people that you develop an arsenal so that you develop an arsenal that would not bankrupt us, because you know we had the example of Soviet Union getting bankrupt. So the point was. You didn't want an expensive, uh, you know, satellite-based surveillance, uh, launch on warning, launch on, you know, that kind of stuff, extensive surveillance network. 
be constantly on your alert uh, if you had a first use posture so this there were there were these three associated reasons for the nfu now many infirmities of nfu became evident as pakistan developed theater nuclear weapons you see for example how would india react if an indian military column was struck by nuclear weapon inside pakistan so so the attack would have been on pakistani territory on uh, on an indian military column so there's a big question you see uh, how would you um, uh, react would you wipe out lahore because of that i don't think that that was a credible kind of a um, uh, a scenario now the second problem was you people ask won't it be um, uh, won't an adversary be tempted to launch a completely devastating first strike because that adversary knows that after that india is going to strike back you know um, a punitive strike or a massive retaliation so instead of facing massive retaliation you were only tempting the adversary to launch an all out attack on you with the first attack first strike all out first strike on you so there were these infirmities and so you know you it was interesting that jaswant singh um, uh, foreign minister who had defended nfu in 1998 99 in 2011 he had changed its position he said we need very greatly need a revision of this nfu uh, against non nuclear powers credible deterrence minimum force had been overtaken by event that's what mr singh said now there was talk of uh, revision of updating of the doctrine when the bjp government uh, in 2014 in their uh, manifesto they had mentioned this but uh, somehow the political uh, sense prevail political uh, wisdom was that let's not touch this and prime minister modi himself Uh, scotch this thing and said no we will uphold uh, uh, you know vajpayee ji's uh, statement now of course everyone uh, the point has been made about uh, china modernization expansion of the chinese art uh, you know uh, arsenal so there are genuine dangers that we face and i think uh, general hasnain and uh, others have referred to this that uh, the chinese capacity for precision long range strike is a major challenge when in a, in a conventional conflict it need not be tanks and other things sort of coming but you know a number a long range precision strikes against indian facilities and these could degrade your nuclear arsenal because if in many cases your nuclear arsenal now most people don't know where nuclear weapons are kept how they are kept but the point is that uh, any kind of conventional missile war between india and china could inadvertently end up uh, taking out let's say half or 75% of your arsenal and so you get into a, what is the nuclear theorist called a use it or lose it scenario so there are many issues that uh, you have to think and then the problem is as of now uh, india uh, talks of massive retaliation but it doesn't have the wherewithal for it agni 5 is just about coming into service the arihan is still far away meaning um, sea based deterrent is still far away so the point is that you have boasted about a, a kind of a, a nuclear doctrine massive retaliation no first use all that is fine but you know now we are uh, in 2022 and many of the the arihant has not come in uh, into line so now uh, bharat has just laid out you know pakistan's first use logic against india is the same as india's logic was is there with china which is the conventional superiority that they have you see and so now the the what do we do in these circumstances <coughs> my own view when it comes to nfu <coughs> is to take the middle path which is that india should follow a uh, st- uh, i think this was suggested by general balraj nagal in 2014 which is a st- track of ambiguity in the sense be deliberately ambiguous about what your nuclear strategy will be let the other guy keep guessing you know uh, instead of uh, any formal nfu or anything thank you thank you thank you uh, manoj joshi sir and i'll i'd, I'd, I'd get dr bharat karnad back in because again i mean manoj joshi sir says that uh, pakistan's uh, approach towards india is similar to india's approach towards pakistan and oh. that nfu the no first use policy uh, Develop- Here's approach to China, meaning so, yes. we 
slightly weaker to China. Yeah. Right. I stand corrected. So uh, when we when we consider this, uh, would you say that uh, eventually the no first use, if we roll it back, it will be seen as more of an aggression or a, a aggressive maneuver, and that, rather than we just let it erode over a period of time, has that happened? Is that the case with the India's stance on no first use? No. Uh, the fact of the matter is, what I have been suggesting is a no first use and a forward deployed posture as a reactive, passive, defensive, the usual military attitude the Indian military and the Indian government has always had in the mountains with China being realized with nuclear weapons. This is a tripwire. It's a nuclear tripwire. I told you the whole notion of uh, the uh, nuclear tripwire is to, in a sense, deter and dissuade Chinese from exercising their conventional military capability and prevent them from breaking through. I thought I said that. And the whole point about this is it, it meshes very nicely with our mindset, which is defensive, passive, reactive. So how is it? In, in any sense, proactive and, you know, going off uh, and, and striking anybody. It is up to the Chinese to break through our lines and ingress in debt because that's the ambiguity there. Forward deployed doesn't mean you are right on the LAC. It means you're forward deployed enough to uh, launch your missiles. And when uh, I think Raja mentioned, you know, uh, Dr. Rajagopalan mentioned that, you know, uh, the uh, we are not going in for uh, a launch and warning, launch on launch. I mean, what is the canisterized Agnes for? It has given us the capability for launch on launch, launch on warning. Our constellation of satellites is not that large. It's true. And that's the reason why I'm saying that if you forward, you know, posture your nuclear weapons, as I'm suggesting, with where you want to place them is our business, but sufficient for it to be activated in case the Chinese PLA breaks through. And that's the point. That is completely in sync with our defensive mindset. That is the point I made. And I'm not sure why it's not getting through. The, the other thing is, I'm astonished when uh, it is said that we lost Arnachal Pradesh is no big deal. A loss of Ladakh is no big deal. And if about the loss of what is a big deal? Now, naturally, you'll say any of the extreme, you know, extremities, provinces and the extremity loss is not a big deal. It's, the, it's precisely the attitude the Indians have always suffered from for a millennia. The point being that you can always withdraw to Nagpur if the circumstances dictate. For God's sake, somewhere you have to hold your line. And, and it cannot be that you are then hostage to what the enemy adversary country does at all times. And, and I'm astonished by this because, again, it's, you know, Pakistan is at most a tactical threat for India. It's not a strategic threat. And I've said this to Pakistani or the military audiences in Pakistan. Then they understand it very well. What is the cost exchange ratio of a nuclear war between India and Pakistan, where China will not get involved, mind you, they're not idiots. The cost exchange ratio is two Indian cities, let's say, and I'm being bloody minded and I've been called that, uh, for the extinction of Pakistan as a social organism. And that's definite. And the Pakistani SPD, the Strategic Plans Division, and I, well, anyway, I met with those guys. I've been in, in the nuclear signaling, at least until about 2007, 2008, where this was made clear to me by the SPD chief at the time. I mean, the man who really was at the center of uh, the SPD. Uh, and it was not uh, uh, Khalid and these people. It was uh, Osaf Ali, Lieutenant General. He was head of operations, SPD plans and operations. Now, this is a man who completely agreed with my cost exchange aspects. And they understand that it will be very difficult for them to lose off a nuclear, initiate a nuclear exchange. Why? Because, you know, you'll suddenly have a Pakistan army without a state. And that's what is said about the Pakistan army, isn't it? It is singular in the sense that it has a state attached to it. It'll have no state. Do you think they're going to risk it? 
think of it think of the kind of uh, investment they have in the pakistani state that they have created they are the guardians of anyway the point is irrelevant to what we are talking about vis-a-vis -vis china china is our main threat loss of arunachal if arunachal pradesh loss if loss of uttarakhand on in the central sector if loss of ladakh is not of any concern is not really central to our territorial being then i'm you know then we might as well not have nuclear weapons i mean for god sake what are nuclear weapons for yes sure nuclear war is unthinkable it's going to be massive it's going to be terrible but the whole point is precisely that isn't it about deterrence it's a map it's a mind game if you're not willing to make the first move in convincing your adversary that you're willing to go the distance then how are you going to be in the game at all then not don't be in it that's what i've argued time and again for 25 years don't be in the game and don't waste your monies on nuclear security if it's all just for you know it's a showcase thing is there because you're always afraid to use it why because nothing critical is at stake it's only a much of the nation that's lost it's only ladakh that's lost for god's sake who cares right is that the attitude we should adopt and finally the cost aspects i costed a 475 warhead weapons arsenal with reserves in my nuclear weapons and indian security book the costing was never questioned by anybody and the very simple thing is this conventional military build up is at least a factor at if not more costlier than um nuclear weapons very simply what you get by way of not just the bang for the buck sort of thing but in terms of the kind of latitude you have for strategic maneuvering etc with the conventional capability may not get you you see is very much there and which we need to be we need to be concerned about and very simply just to discuss the cost and this is the dated thing but let's uh, recall what dr pk aingar the late chairman of the indian atomic energy commission said for 1 mig 21 and he's talking about 1980s cost and i'm just giving you the notional uh, aspects of what the cost differential is you get one nuclear bomb now a mig 21 and now the cost of a frontline fighter combat aircraft goes up almost in a geometric sense in real terms and the cost of nuclear weapons if you have a full fledged program which we are don't have now and it will be very easy to ramp up with the kind of self constraints you have put in with this wretched 2008 nuclear civil in accord and god knows what not you are really screwing ourselves and our interests up the cost unit cost of a nuclear weapon is going down not up we are building a weapon city in karnataka we are doing the kinds of things even with these sunk costs the unit cost of warhead is far far cheaper than conventional military build up which becomes you know obsolete even as you begin fielding it that's a real problem and ultimately that's the reason why why say pakistan has nuclear weapons because they cannot keep up with the conventional military indian build up and why we cannot keep up with the chinese why the north koreans cannot keep up with the americans and that's why you have nuclear weapons which where the credibility is the central aspect and the will and the credibility if that's missing and if all you can come up with is the kind of rationales that or oh, the loss of this doesn't matter loss of that doesn't matter loss of, you know then i'm afraid uh, you know the, the entire edifice of deterrence is hollow right because you can always argue that in lose all of north india south of uh, india is perfectly fine viable uh, nation state i'm from the south so i'd be quite happy to be uh, south of and so i imagine would be raja gopal and you can go back to chennai and you know south of the vindhya is all very happy and we are a far more uh, you know rich country anyway if you get into peninsula india as a sovereign country i mean what can you argue as not important really now you have to begin to draw the red line for our main adversary not pakistan not pakistan I keep saying the general mentioned pakistan pakistan general we should have another debate sometime on our own but if you mention 65 for god sake we had gone to bata nagar and he is there as you well know we were there the trijat uh, uh, had encamped on the other side of ichigil everything was go had we had air cover 
We didn't give it deliberately. Why? Because the Shastri government uh, then feared that if we took Lahore, all of Pakistan would collapse. That was the reason. And that's what General Harbak told me, and he was frothing at the mouth because he had visions of being the second the coming of Maharaja Ranjit Singh to capture Lahore. And I'm not kidding you. This is the kind of things you face. The military faces in terms of constraints, political constraints. Maybe that was the right decision. I think it was the right decision. Because if you don't have the buffer state of Pakistan, look, think of the mess we would have been in terms of the extremist Islamic incubus, the fundamentalist extremist, radical Islamist. We have to deal with it even with Pakistan as a buffer. If we didn't have that, what would happen? So these are aspects you have to keep in mind. While we think of Pakistan, really, we have to help them secure their deterrence, make them feel however secure we can and make them feel in whatever manner we can make them feel secure, but deal with China, which is not so easily pacified. Thank you. Thank May you I ask Dr. a question I, yes. of uh, Dr. Yes, Karna? Please. Okay. Thank you, sir. Very, very nice. Very interesting. Your, your these are always so good to listen to. Uh, just commencing this with the General Padmanabhan's statement during Operation Parakram, if you remember, Totally endorsing your thing, massive retaliation. He said Pakistan will stop, cease to exist. That is what he said at that particular time. But you haven't answered my basic question, which I which I had alluded to. That why are we stuck in these semantics? I mean, war fighting is not semantics. You say and if you you say if you if you mean many other things, we can. I'm sure. I'm sure. I, I'm sure we can adopt an NFU and when the contingency arises, no one in the world is going to question our wisdom under threat with a red line having been crossed uh, for us to launch a first use. Who is going to question it at that point? So why can't we just, as very correctly said by uh, Manoj, that uh, you, know, you, you keep this ambiguous. You remember through the 80s how the Pakistanis took us for a ride? With the ambiguity. One day they said we've got it, one day they said we don't have it, and we were here left floundering around to wonder what kind of a response will we have if they've got it and if they've not got it. For for the better part of almost 20 years, they kept us thinking, wondering what the hell the Pakistanis have got until finally in 1998 they revealed their hand. Secondly, I mean I would like you to ask this answer this question particularly, in fact, for your wisdom and your background. The second thing is uh, I do think you are underplaying Pakistan. Six lakh, a six lakh army against a 1.3 million army, largely deployed on the northern borders at the moment with a force ratio, which isn't too much in our favor at this, at this particular moment. I'm reminded of what's happening in Ukraine. I mean, Ukraine with what it has got, it stood up to the Russians. Of course, the Russians have now got the better of them, are getting the better of them. But you see for the last four months, what's been happening there. And this is what happened in 65 also. Uh, of course, 71 was a different kettle of fish, but 65 it happened, and yes, we were in Batanagar and we were on the on the on the doorstep of Lahore. But you can't forget the contingency which was created by what happened in Asal Uttar. And the midnight uh, call Jan Chaudhary made to Jan Harbaksh to say uh, pull back, get back to Bias, you Jalandhar is going is more crucial for us. And and then then uh, Jan Harbaksh, of course, made sure that he didn't respond to the chief's call at that particular time. And those are the situations I was painting for you. They're sort of interest, nothing else. But I do want to emphasize on this. We should not treat Pakistan with, a, with kid gloves in that manner. Uh, I would throw up a scenario. I can't think of it yet. But I, I think even a subconventional scenario concerning Pakistan may require some kind of a response at some stage, which I can't think of at the moment. But there have been situations which possibly one could dream of, in which case, a very large subconventional kind of a strike by Pakistan would require a response which is appropriate uh, in nature. So uh, this is another aspect which I would uh, request you to uh, comment upon. Lastly, I, I don't think, uh, maybe Dr. Rajesh will speak for himself, of course, but I don't think he really meant that Ladakh is dispensable and Arunachal Pradesh is dispensable. We were talking about red lines, essentially. For me, um, the Ladakh range itself in Ladakh is a red line. The Suliguri corridor is a, is a red line. 
uh, Arunachal, the first stretch of, of uh, territory till, uh, till Sela, maybe a little behind Sela, is itself a red line, right? And, uh, and uh, we may have NFU or no. If situation comes, uh, push comes to shove. In that kind of a situation, yes, we will retaliate. We will retaliate with what we have at that particular time. But my last point is, with all the confidence that with which we are speaking about first use, I wish we can, we, can, we can first ensure that we have the resources and the capability, which is what is being built up today in a huge way by, the, by this government. Once we have that in our hands, we are in a far better position to be able to speak with confidence about first use. Thank you. Can I make a point, uh, Associate? Sure. You know, I'll take up from uh, the last point made by Atal. You know, it's all right, NFU, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, my worry is, again, precisely that. You know, that the Indian thermonuclear deterrent didn't work in the test. It's an untested system. And if we are going to have a long-range missile threatening China, wiping out so-and-so, and you have an untested thermonuclear weapon. It didn't work. And so there are basic problems. So associated with that, my point is to build up, you know, your the, 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 the other aspects of your arsenal. That is that whether you want to develop more, uh, more accurate missiles, you know, I don't trust the DRDO uh, too much on many of the claims that they make. Uh, about the accuracy of this and the accuracy of that and all kinds of things. I mean, I can write a whole book on that. Um, there's no, uh, because I've been following them almost since 1984 when I began uh, my career uh, as a uh, journalist. Now, uh, the, the, the issue right now is the modernization and building up of the arsenal. So one is the question of numbers. We have seen China expanding its numbers. And so we need a systematic response to that because China had a certain uh, set of numbers. China had a certain uh, deployment pattern. They are changing their deployment pattern. They merving their systems, you know. So we have we have to respond to these individual kind of um, uh, developments. And the Chinese track our what we do very closely. When the Agni Five test began took place. <clears throat> Within a week, there was a story in the Chinese media about uh, a missile tracking radar station that had been activated in the Qinghai Plateau of Tibet. In the sense, what was the purpose of the missile tracking radar? It is to track Indian missiles heading for China. So they made it very clear within a week of our uh, uh, missile test that they... Uh, but they were keeping pace with what we are up to. So I think it's very important, uh, as um, uh, Atta said, that the nuts and bolts part of it. We need to focus on this. You know, uh, doctrine is important. Statements are important. Uh, to a certain extent, bluff works in the nuclear area. But I think you also need the nuts and bolts. We look at hypersonics. Hypersonic, um, uh, you know, uh, systems, the importance of hypersonic systems uh, in all this, the importance of surveillance satellites, the importance of drones, meaning a combination uh, your Agni 5 is a road mobile missile and a combination of a surveillance satellite and drones in, in wartime situations can virtually track each missile and knock it out. Meaning you have to factor because this is road mobile. The only one really safe is if 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 you are um, uh, uh, have a seaborne deterrent, and the seaborne deterrent, as far as we are concerned, is not yet anywhere near being fully functional. We have some way um, uh, 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 to go out there. So my point is, let's also focus on that. And finally, with regard to the Indian, uh, the red lines, I think it's an important statement that. Uh, that that uh, it's not the issue of Ladakh or whatever it is. Uh, I'd like to emphasize that we have very strong defenses along the Himalaya. In fact, India uh, Indian uh, forces are much more forward towards the line of actual control. Now the Chinese are build, building up uh, to some extent. 
But given the nature of the defenses, they are in-depth defenses, they are very strong defenses. And for the first time, we are also developing strike capability. We have at least two uh, cores which we have identified for strike. So I think uh, if it comes to cross Himalayan battle, it is the Chinese who also need to worry. To a certain extent, it's not uh, there. We are not looking at 65 scenario or, or 62 scenario. Uh, there can be very different scenarios um, uh, that take place uh, in the future. Can we have uh, Dr. Rajagopal respond to that? Uh, when uh, Manoj Joshi said, talks about the nuts and bolts part of it, would you agree with that discussion though? Yeah, I mean, you know, I've, I said before that uh, we need to expand our capabilities uh, as far as uh, as far as our reach goes. I mean, not in terms of numbers. I mean, numbers, you know, I don't know where we are at or where we plan to be at. But a couple of hundred is fine. I mean, I don't think we need a huge arsenal. But, you know, definitely. I mean, it's absurd to me that, uh, what, four decades after we started the missile program that we don't have uh, an ICBM ready. I mean, it's still sort of working at it, working at it, working at it, or we don't have an SLBM with, you know, with uh, intercontinental ranges. So it's, you know, that part of it definitely. I mean, I have no objection to expanding our technological capabilities. And these are not, this is not exactly high technology. I mean, you know, North Koreans can do it, China can, China does it. If this is not exactly, uh, I mean, I, I really don't know why we haven't developed that level of capability but you know that that i have numbers i have a, an issue but i mean i don't think as far as capabilities go uh, i would disagree but to come back to this question about arunachal and ladakh and whatnot uh the point is the point i was making was about uh the purpose of nuclear weapons and the purpose of nuclear weapons i was saying was ensuring survival and let's assume let's take the uh the scenario that uh, Bharat laid out which was to say, if there is a, you know, if we forward deploy our nuclear missiles and, um, you know, as a tripwire and then, um, you know, dare the Chinese to take it or whatever. Um, if, let's assume, for, I mean, it, it's not just a firing of that first weapon that matters, right? I mean, in the sense that if we, if we put our missiles up front uh, and uh, we do actually employ them, uh, if they are, if China is deterred by it, great. But I, you know, I'm that for that we will have to tell them where exactly our missiles are, obviously, because otherwise they wouldn't know where which is our no-go area, which is their no-go area, and whatnot. But if you, if we actually fire uh, a weapon, let's say, if we attack China with nuclear weapons because we lost the dark or our position, what's the next step? Right? I mean, China is going to say, oh, sorry, we crossed China, India's red line, so let's push back, pull back. Is that what they're going to do? If we use nuclear weapons on China, China is going to use nuclear weapons on India, right? So the essential, essential consequence of using nuclear weapons because China took a a, a, a part of India uh, is that India's national survival is itself as well as China's. I mean, if there is a full-scale nuclear war, both us, both India and China are uh, essentially destroyed. I mean, for all practical purposes. So. Uh, so because we, so that's why I'm saying at a stage where national survival is anyway under question, either because of conventional, uh, either because of conventional means or because of a nuclear fire, nuclear attack, that at that stage, there is no point in holding back. I mean, so therefore nuclear weapons in that sense is to deter that threat to national survival. If you use nuclear weapons for because you lost a part of your territory. Uh, and I'm not saying that is that territory is, you know, we should allow it to be taken or whatever else. I mean, obviously, we should use whatever military means we have. I, I don't understand the logic of using nuclear weapons to retain the territory, because if you use nuclear weapons to retain the territory, then you're losing the rest of the country and China, I mean, obviously. But um, so that, that, that logic just doesn't make any sense to me, because if you did use nuclear weapons, what would be the consequence for the rest of the country, right? I mean, and so, um, so I, you know, I, it, that's why, um, irrespective, that's why the, the Pakistani threat that they would use nuclear weapons if you retaliated to terrorist attacks never made any sense to me. And I repeatedly argue that India has, uh, you know, India can escalate uh, at the conventional level because Pakistan is not going to use nuclear weapons unless our tanks are side, standing outside our country. Yeah, I mean, short of that, Pakistan is not going to use nuclear weapons. And we have seen repeatedly plenty of cases where 
countries have lost wars without resorting to nuclear weapons country if people don't use nuclear weapons leaders don't use nuclear weapons simply because they lost a war or simply because unless that war is a war of national survival I mean, so so in a sense that that uh, that um, using the argument that you can use nuclear weapons to stave off a defeat at the border uh, i think i would strongly disagree with that because that basically means your country is already gone i mean so at that stage we are national survival either because of an enemy nuclear attack or because of conversion i mean some kind of, india doesn't face that problem i mean I, i don't think india faces threat of survival through a conversion like okay, pakistan maybe pakistan perceives that israel uh, taiwan maybe. i mean ukraine definitely right i mean so but i again we talked about the fact that is ukraine made a mistake in giving up its nuclear weapons so um so so it 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 doesn't make sense for a country that is as large as india to or it doesn't sort of i uh, to me it makes uh, very little uh, it it doesn't make sense that we would face a threat of conventional uh, a, a threat of survival due to conversion so the only threat that we face is through a nuclear attack and that's precisely why our nuclear weapons are to deter that attack because that if you are anyway if a survivor is anyway threatened what difference is it make? but if short of a threat to survival why would you invite a threat to that survival right by using nuclear weapons because you lost a war at the border you are essentially threatening your own survival that makes to me that makes no sense um obviously what that means is also that i'm not i'm not discounting the fact that we obviously have to enhance our conventional military capability we have to be much more proactive we have to be much more offensive at the border uh, we are very reactive on those things i would agree with parat but um that is a, those are all good arguments for enhancing india's conventional military forces not for sub- substituting uh, conventional nuclear weapons for conventional lack of conventional capabilities at some stage if, for example you know if, if china decides tomorrow to dis- to say that oh all of asia is china's and you know that we will conquer india it definitely I mean, that 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 make, that makes sense if we face a conventional threat but we don't face that conventional threat um to national survival right? i mean and, and uh, so to me that does not uh, that is not particularly logical can i just uh, i mean uh, It, it is remarkable you know where is the empirical evidence uh, that you are talking about about border wars and nuclear weapons being threatened to be used where is that happen pa- pa- pakistan no, is the official no 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 <laughs> pakistan can talk all it wants you know i know the trouble is we get easily deterred that's our problem right assuming pakistan is such a big threat which i discount entirely and i have been doing I, so i didn't i didn't say pakistan was a big threat i on that i might agree with you I mean, the point making was about but, but, but you know but you know uh, bharat pakistan has been a pain in the you know what and uh, you can be a pain in the same no, sense no, this this stability instability nonsense that been perpe- you know perpetuated by the american academics for god sake in the same stability instability paradox that these uh, guys created out of thin air was uh, there in the 1950s between the su uh, soviet union and america was the what were we talking about when i mean this happened in the cuban missile crisis the whole point was they said we'll respond and we'll better any at any level of uh, action that you want to get to and in any case the point is this uh, you know uh, in all my book six since my uh, you know in my time in the nsab in drafting the doctrine and so on helping draft the doctrine i mean i think three or four days after the test i said that the thermonuclear was a fizzle i've been saying ever since that we have to resume testing for thermonuclear weapons that been one of my pet themes in all my books now one of the things that the nuclear establishment not so much the nuclear establishment it is the uh, you know the uh, whoever is in the powers that be in delhi who don't understand the technical aspects keep talking about and and this is for reasons of their own uh, because the great physicists are now gone our weapons directed has been really denuded of talent and i can tell you that the best people don't go into it anymore because it's simply not challenging enough and we are suffering from it i know people in there and i have known them for 30 years now and i'm sorry to say the best people are not going in there why because you have a stand still kind of a mindset 
You are building delivery weapons uh, systems. It's true. And even there, you are not going ahead. The ICBM was not uh, produced, uh, Mr. Rajagopalan, not because the DRDO didn't work. They are shoddy workers. They take time and all that. And But if you ask them, they say there's political compulsion not to go ICBM. Merving. We have had a Merving design prototype on the advanced uh, systems laboratory in Hyderabad for the last 20 years on the shelf. And no government in Delhi has had the gumption or the guts to say, let's at least test the goddamn thing and get a thing onto our missiles. We have tested a three uh, warhead configuration on our nose stones. All kinds of things have done it. We have not gone with it because of the lack of political will. Now, that's what I keep saying. It's, the, it's not what we have. It is what you don't have in terms of the political will and the strategic vision or even an understanding of what strategic weapons are about. Because we keep talking about reducing everything down to Pakistan, Pakistan, Pakistan. For God's sake, if you want to uh, you know, screw Pakistan, go ahead and screw it. And, and they're falling apart. You don't, they don't need your help. You want to give them a push? Do it. It'll be at your cost. It'll be at your cost. So start dealing with China in right royal manner. And what I've said is thermonuclear, we have to resume testing. We have not I mean, done. Let me, let, me, let me understand. I mean, I mean, one little thing. We, I said atomic demolition munitions also. That is my first thing, not the forward deployed uh, Agni's. Have atomic demolition munitions, which are even more passive. You can bring down, by the way, the Chinese will have a very difficult uh, uh, provocation if they think that's a nuclear provocation. After a good part of uh, leading elements of the group army ingresses into India and we bring a mountainside down on it without venting radioactivity, mind the way. The best radioact anti-radioactivity uh, thing is Earth coming down on you. We kill off a whole goddamn brigade worth of the Chinese well, in dress, whatever, then say, it, you know, let, let it uh, be uh, left to the Chinese to say uh, that this is an initiative which needs a nuclear response. And then and, 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 and the last thing before I, uh, you know, I don't want to monopolize the time, but the thing is, you have, when someone says, oh, we can switch doctrines and we can switch operations just like, I'm sorry, General. I mean, you know, as well as you, uh, as anybody else, perhaps better than all of us, you know, when a force trains on a certain doctrinal principle and they believe it, and then overnight you say, well, no, well, that is just for the thing, you know, and we can just go ahead and go offensive off the bat without preparation, the whole downstream thing that you have to get in line before you do that. If you say we have all that in line, fine, then everything, we can switch our offensive, uh, defensive things uh, on a point. But that's not how it happens. You know that. Our strategic forces command is not structured that way. I mean, I don't want to get into it, but this is ridiculous to assume that we can switch on the border as circumstances demand. No, you cannot. That will be reckless and suicidal. Meaning that if you're going to go first, you that has to be a doctrinal setup. You have to be ready to do it. You have to have infrastructure downstream, everything, surveillance setup. Yes, it requires that. My point is in cost effective terms, cost benefit terms, it might pay better dividend if it did that. Then we build up conventionally in a manner that we have, which is really uh, still industrial age military. The army is still industrial age uh, and so is the Air Force. I mean, we are still not into the hardcore drone swarms, AI driven weapons, robotic systems and so on. We are about 30 years behind in real terms. So, well, you know, what is the protection we have in the meantime? Well, the Chinese are racing ahead and are posing a threat to the United States. The US is saying they're ahead of us in cyber war, AI driven systems. So how far behind are we? Two and a half generations behind? I mean, how? I mean, we can talk about it. But this is the real problem that we don't grasp the hard reality of how backward we are in terms of real, real strategic means and keeping up with cutting edge technology. And the Chinese are. 
I mean, that's a whole other uh, debate about technological capability and economic capability and whatnot. I mean, that is not about NFU or any difference because what you were saying earlier was not about uh, ADMs. You were talking about firing missiles into China, right? I mean, and, you know, when you talk about that's what you said. I mean, so that's I what said, I mean. But, but, but a, a, my, my first thing, if you recall, Raja, in my first book, I said ADMs in my first very first book. 2002 book, I talked about atomic demolition munitions. Thereafter, yeah, I have but, defined over the years in my books where I've argued why it is that we now have to have, you know, a, a missile build-up. Along yeah, with that's, ADMs. That's, those ADMs, are two different things. Those no, are two different no, things. No, I mean, no, two, no, two different things. It's the second if tier. Yes. It's a layered yes. offensive yes. system. Dr. Bharat, may I, may, yes. may, I, may I come back on yes. your last issue, which you had risen with me, on the issue of semantics. What prevents us from preparing ourselves for that first use? But let's go ahead and do everything we need. The infrastructure, the command and control, etc. And follow a policy of no first use. What is the, what is the problem in that? I, I think it's very the obvious. Way. You are putting it the other way around. What you are saying is that you can't have an NFU and switch to first use. I'm saying have a first use capability. And um, don't follow the first use capability, follow NFU. You know, the, the real problem, Atha, the real problem is, <laughs> is in all our defense and security policies is in the realm of our political leadership. Our political leadership is simply not willing to, us, to, to uh, delve into this in a kind of a specialized way. Meaning look into issues of nuclear uh, uh, forces, why they are uh, nuclear forces, what they should do. You know, so, so their attitude towards the thing is, this is the job for the uh, uh, army, let them handle this. But that's not true. Because unless and until you have very systematic and uh, in-depth kind of political guidance and leadership, you cannot have a viable uh, nuclear policy. So it has to be a reactive policy. It will be a reactive policy. And so I would like to say that the primary blame for the state of affairs lies with our political leadership. Full stop. Um, Manoj, may I, if I, if I may just, you see, I have, I don't know how much you have interacted with the parliamentary committees, etc. on defense. I'm sure you have many times probably. My, my experience of dealing with political leaders uh, involved with defense is a little different. I don't think, first of all, that they are disinterested. I do feel that many times I have come across some very, very uh, uh, vocal, extremely intellectual uh, politicians who understand this whole thing. It's a question of decision making at the government of India level, uh, finally. But otherwise, the, the, the political community at large in India, I think today is far, far better than what it was several decades ago. You know, Atta, you use the word parliamentary committee. Now, what's the fascinating thing is that the all the parliamentary committee reports are first rate. First rate, meaning they propose things which um, other committees have proposed subsequently. The problem is when the same guys become government, they seem to, you know, kind of lose their way. They seem to lose their nerve. They don't, they just don't apply their minds. Yeah, but again, let, let me just get in uh, Lieutenant General Hasnayan on this because again, when we talk about the political will and having the strategic vision, uh, one question that comes to my mind immediately is that we have seen a structural revamping of the Indian Armed Forces under the current uh, Indian leadership and General, late General Bipin Rawat. Uh, so would you have said that we are also undergoing a kind of structural revamp in our nuclear posture? Would that also be in the works? Would, would you expect that to be happening simultaneously? Uh, Lieutenant General, sir, you are on mute. I would not like to comment too much on that because I'm really not privy to it. It's not something I don't I don't go to the strategic forces command and sit across the table with them and speak and that kind of a thing. Yes, but there are a lot of SFC people with whom of the of the uh, uh, radar one does talk to them and and get them get oneself a, a, a little more updated. I would say a tremendous amount of work is going on under the current government. There's no doubt about it. On the in the entire defense domain, there's a tremendous amount of work going on, and uh, Atman Nirbharta perhaps is you know dominating the whole show, and because of which the aspects of doctrine etc are not really being spoken about so much. Uh, I do feel that the coming of a second CDS 
will make a difference. Definitely, uh, it's waiting for that. Uh, everyone is held back a little bit at the moment. Uh, it is the coming of the CDS will actually have that so-called single window kind of a kind of a reference point that will probably be able to build up on the very good work which General Bipin Rawat had done so far. Not that I'm sure that there has been too much work on the nuclear domain uh, as such. Mr. Manohar Parekar, I do remember, was very inquisitive. He was, he was always into this questioning, finding out. He was, he was a different politician that way in many time, many ways. Uh, uh, Mr. Rajnath himself is proving to be a person who is uh, also delving very deeply into this whole game of, um, of um, uh, military affairs as such. So it's good to have these kind of Raksha Mantris with us. And I'm sure under them, the, the overall confidence of the armed forces is increasing. But uh, to say specifically that anything is happening in the nuclear domain, I would not be able to put much uh, uh, information on no, that. I, I would like to make a point here. Uh, I was a member of the Naresh Chandra Task Force on National Security. So we looked at every aspect from we recommended chairman chiefs of staff committee reform uh, many of the reform uh, uh, measures that have been taken subsequently but right in the beginning we had a meeting now i'm not going to mention names and we said uh, who will brief us on the nuclear uh, strategy they said oh no 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 that's not your job that's not your job meaning uh, <laughs> nuclear is separate from uh, the rest of defense what? So that's why Atta is helpless. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because you are right, actually. Because, right. because You're the right. point is, the point is that this is my critique of the government that you have completely, uh, you know, it's a completely messy situation where you keep the armed forces out of that. Yet the nuclear weapons are embedded uh, within the armed forces. You know, they are embedded there. They are. They are. They are located co-located often uh, within uh, uh, cantonments and others. So, and so you're going to have a military which is fighting its war, not knowing whether it is crossing other countries' red lines or whether it is going to go into nuclear thing. Uh, I had a cousin who unfortunately has passed away. He was a colonel at the time of uh, the um, uh, Operation Parakram. So he was very proud. He told me, you know, I would have been the first guy to, to go into um, uh, Sindh in uh, in in 2000 and uh, um, 2002 i would have been the first guy so i said what if the pakistanis had nuked you so he tells me oh that's not my, my problem that's uh, for the government to look uh, to take care of so i said guys the government will take care of it but you're the guy who gets nuked you see so i'm saying the separation uh, you know there are a lot of issues a lot of problems meaning it's a, a I, I, I can i can assure you i can assure you there was a time where i want to tell you particularly this because the Indian Armed Forces have made tremendous progress in these issues. There was a time many years ago when the O word, you know, you've heard of the F word and you've heard of all kinds of words, but the O word, the O word was offensive. The term offensive was shunned in the Indian Armed Forces. The moment you said, we are going to discuss something offensive, people were told, please go out, who all are authorized to sit here and they listen to it. And people were moved out. It's only after Parakram. Is after Parakram that things started changing when this proactive strategy business came into being. And now we talk only offensive. We only talk the O word. And, and that is what actually what Dr. Kannad is saying is absolutely correct. You need to build up that. You need to build up that offensive spirit, that capability. This is what we should be looking at. Um, I would suggest that, that I, I, while I strongly agree that we need to have much more of an offensive as well as commercial weapons go and commercial strategy and doctrine goes. You can't have an offensive uh, doctrine when it comes to nuclear weapons. That's a kind of entirely different beast. So, I mean, I, you know, I have been critical of, uh, you know, different governments. I, I'm, I'm an academic, so I'm outside of all of these, um, all of the other various groups that uh, all of the others are members of. But, I mean, to the extent that I can see from outside, I've been a critic of the, the very defensive approach to whether it is terrorism from Pakistan or China's moves in the dark and so on and so forth or anywhere else. Um, but that those two things have to be kept separate. I think I think while we should uh, have a much more offensive orientation when it comes to conventional forces and conventional strategies and whatnot, um, 
and uh, obviously we should have uh, devote both more time and attention to uh, many of the lacunae especially in terms of civil military um that can't be uh, i mean nuclear weapons are distinct and separate they are not the same thing as nuclear so i think we need the logic of that is very different so we need to keep those two things separately i mean that's all i would say so now I, otherwise i entirely agree with uh, general hasnain and uh, manoj Uh, yeah, can I know, just uh, uh, yes, <laughs> yes, Doctor Kardar, I'll come to you. But again, I, I'm just tempted uh, to keep this uh, conversation going, this most engaging conversation going. But again, as as I'm told, uh, we are running to the end of our uh, program. But before that, I'll let Doctor Kardar have the final word because I started the whole discussion with Doctor Kardar. That's and always so a bad idea. So I'd like to have, <laughs> so I'd like Doctor Kardar to have the final word. Sorry to disappoint you, Raja, but it's all right. No fine. This is this won't be end. Next time, though. Please, please, the. Uh, General uh, Hasnain mentioned the fact that the military is doing all it uh, can to, you know, uh, up, uh, shall we say, upgrade itself to whatever capability is necessary and so on in terms of technology, etc. Now, in terms of one of our real problems, and this is sort of leads right into why the offensive doctrinal thing is not easy to switch on a coin, is because you do not have a military. Uh, and uh, general you'll bear me out that is nuclear wise knowledgeable you know you have rotational postings everybody is into rotational postings and i've known uh, you know hundred you know, literally tens of uh, see you know the uh, strategic forces command commanders sinks coming in and going who, who have a very bare understanding of what it is that they're handling right and that is why i've been saying that each of these services should have a nuclear wing now i remember uh, admiral dk joshi telling me uh, that yes the, uh, the we have going, we are going to have nuclear powered submarines they're firing nuclear weapons ordnance and therefore we are going to go in uh, like the us uh, naval uh, uh, nuclear service uh, you know all the submarines officered by specialists uh, and as in the russian navy etc we too are having it now it was during dk joshi's time i haven't heard of there might be a beginning there but in the navy but that's the only service that is even thinking about it the army has no sense you know air force is completely out of it they have no strategic weapons uh, platforms and i've been saying we should lease the black jack uh, tu160 bomber we don't have a man recallable vector in our uh, arsenal you know and we only have a missile that can be uh, you know uh, shall we say uh, terminated mid flight if it is a wrong thing whatever happens but that's not the point the point is you have to have a recallable vector we don't have it with the sukhoi 30s which are medium range let's be very honest about it it will need the kind of strenuous tactical routing which is going to be difficult for any air force to pull off and this is what i've been arguing for years the last thing all this is going to cost money money is a real problem now the question is what are your priorities that's the reason why in one sense the convention military is very correct to say that if you're going to have a nuclear build up it may be at our expense and which has been by the way the thinking from when general manekshaw uh, when he was the eastern army commander uh, in the 62 war and who was again nuclear weapons then by the way when uh, humi baba came out and said in response to the 64 uh, chinese uh, test explosion that we should explode too and this by this by he said in 62 trying to convince nehru let's go with a nuclear test that we'll somehow be able to manage to build up our morale and then begin having nuclear weapons 62 when we were humiliated baba said and yet there was no follow up from the civilian side now that's why i've been saying we have to have a strategic budget for strategic armaments keep it separate from conventional military so there's no uh, you know clash there one of the reasons the conventional military feels compelled to say oh let's have minimum this minimum that minimal this minimal nothing you know zero out the whole damn thing is because they feel that their uh, armaments and their forces are at risk if you begin building nuclear build up so these are various things that you have to think of that the government is not thinking of i'm sorry to say uh, and you know we may be 
we may get it in the neck very soon, sooner than we think. You know, depends upon how the Chinese read our, uh, uh, the American unreliability as an ally and partner, and is they completely unreliable, and it's so wrong of us to think that they're going to come to our rescue. We have been free riding on security for so long. There are no free lunches, no free ride on security anymore, which is why we have to rely on ourselves. And, and ultimately, that's where, uh, Dr. Rajagopalan, the, the tiered uh, atomic demolition munitions, and then you have second tier uh, backup with the forward postured uh, missiles come into play. Because... We have no option. We are not. We do not have the resources to build up every which way as Chinese have. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Karnad. Uh, would Would uh, Joshi sir like to add to anything that Dr. Karnad said, Manoj sir? No, I've already uh, made my point that I think that the biggest failure uh, is of the political class, and I still maintain that. And I agree with Bharat about the Navy. Uh, in fact, there was a proposal for the Navy to get uh, uh, a flight of, of Russian bombers. I forget to you. Uh, I forget which one uh, it was. And, TU-160. Uh, yeah. No, the meaning, I think it was another one. There was some other uh, uh, number, which I remember. But whatever it is, it didn't happen. So it that's didn't a TU-22 backfire bomber. Yeah. That, that's, yeah, something yeah. Different. that's something different. So you know, that was, uh, you know, anyway. So, so the, the, the uh, uh, point here is that unless and until uh, the nuclear doctrine, this no first use, all, all of this, because if, if, you see, as I told you, when, when we were told off by this government official in the Narish Chandra Committee, he said that nuclear issues have nothing to do with defense. They are political weapons. So what I'm saying is this is the attitude which is all pervasive. Unless and until there is an integration of the doctrines, the, the nuclear doctrine or whatever it is, uh, and, and the conventional doctrine of the armed forces, they should, of course, uh, the joint doctrine of the armed forces there, but it's kind of just a paper thing. But unless there is an integration there, unless you look at these security issues in an integrated fashion, you're going to be in trouble. And with one point, I don't know whether that was mentioned, uh, that this... Uh, uh, the, the, the Chinese, uh, their rocket force, they keep their conventional and nuclear missiles together. There's no separation. So you don't know what's coming at you, you know, whether it's conventional, whether it's nuclear. Uh, so so there, is, there, is, there are issues which, which we need to address. But in any case, that's not the uh, point right now. Thank you. May I make just Gentlemen, one point? Yes. Uh, sure. Uh, uh, I entirely endorse the last uh, intervention by Dr. Bharat Karnad. The aspect of civilization. You see, one of the major things that we are suffering from from the in the armed forces is this whole transfer business, uh, <coughs> uh, this whole business of going from peace to field and staff to um, you know um, into units and back. <coughs> there has to be a degree of civilization, a mix of civilization along with the military in most of these strategic fields. I can tell you one other field. In which, on which perhaps the argumentative Indians may like to have a full seminar on themselves. And that is the whole area of communication strategy. See the way Pakistan has had our happiness on uh, the, the ISPR, which was raised in 1949, the Inter-Services Public Relations. We have, no, we have no body, no arm, no understanding, no capability to fight a modern day social media war or an information war against Pakistan at all today. Because those who are into it at the moment are on two-year postings, two-and-a-half-year postings. They go away carrying all the talent with them or whatever they have learned. Until you have civilized information warriors, unless you have civilized component of the strategic buildup in the country, I think they, 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 they are, these are the problems that we will continue to face. Thank you, gentlemen. Lieutenant General Sayyid Atta Hasnan, Dr. Bharat Karnad. Dr. Rajesh Rajagopalan and Sri Manoj Joshiji, thank you so much uh, for uh, peppering us with all these facts and this opinion over the course of the last 90 minutes. Uh, I'm sure our viewers will go home most aware of the recent uh, developments. And uh, of course, uh, the question still remains open though. 
the should India discard its first no first use policy? For those of you who are watching us on YouTube, do comment and let us know your thoughts on this issue. And if you did like this uh, discussion, do consider subscribing and throwing us a like. On behalf of all of us here at Argumentative Indians, once again, gentlemen, Lieutenant General Hasnain, Dr. Karnad, Sri Joshi, and Dr. Rajagopalan, thank you so much for joining us here at Argumentative Indians. On behalf of all of us here, this is Bhuvan Apurvichha signing off. Till I see you with once, once again with another debate coming soon on India's fastest growing thought platform, Argumentative Indians. This is Bhuvan Apurvichha signing off. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.